thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. saying, 
send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. <clears throat> the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We will now chant together Psalm 1. <laughs>
thirsty, I will give water, the gift from the spring of the water of life. The word of the Lord. I Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for the other. My brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. There's a tradition in the Episcopal Church called an instructed Eucharist. Anybody ever heard of that? No. I haven't done one in a very long time, and I thought it's about time to do one again, except that I'm going to do it differently than I've done in the past. In the past, what I've done is given a big outline and as we've celebrated the Eucharist, we've stopped at certain moments to talk about where we are in that outline of the entire service and how it relates to our faith and the tradition of the church. I find that a very disjointed way to celebrate the Eucharist on a Sunday morning. So I thought what I would do this year is I'm going to do two Sundays. This Sunday, we're going to talk about what's called in our prayer book, the Word of God, or the Liturgy of the Word, which is the first half of the Eucharist. And then next Sunday, we're going to go over what's considered uh, by the prayer book heading the Holy Communion, or the Liturgy of the Eucharist. So I put a little outline, mine's all written on, in your bulletin, but maybe you can pull that out. And also, if you want, open your prayer book to page 355. On that bulletin insert, there's a part one and a part two. 
We're doing part one today. Next Sunday we'll do part two. Going back to the earliest church, and I'm talking early church, the tradition of how we worship on Sundays really spans the entire 2,000 years. And very, very early after Jesus' resurrection, what we do on a Sunday morning already had taken form. There's a great uh, analogy to this in um, the Gospel of Luke, where we have the story of the disciples walking to Emmaus. In that story, we have two of Jesus' disciples meeting him, the resurrected Jesus, on the road to Emmaus, not recognizing him. And during that first half of the walk, he talks to them about the prophets, he reveals things to them about their faith, and he kind of ties in all together the tradition of, the, of Judaism with what had happened that week during the Passion. And the scriptures say their hearts were on flame listening to him. And so when they get to their final destination, which I imagine was some kind of inn, they invite the stranger in with them for the meal. And in the breaking of the bread, in that sacred meal, Jesus is revealed to them. So in this scripture story from St. Luke, we have the two parts of the Eucharist. We have the liturgy of the Word, and we have the liturgy of the sacred meal. Now, the early Christians, you have to remember, after Jesus' resurrection, would gather on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, by the way, if you knew that. <laughs> and they would worship together. And they would do it in a very Jewish way, because at first, they are still Jews. And they're using the Jewish traditional methods of worship, so they are incorporating the synagogue service along with the Passover meal. So, since the Jews had come back from exile, in Palestine, the synagogue uh, movement had started where every village had a synagogue. And on the Sabbath, Jews would meet together to read from the sacred scriptures, to read from the prophets, to sing psalms, and then to have some kind of commentary on what was being read to them. A teaching moment. I won't call it a sermon, but it was a teaching moment. That was how Jesus grew up. That's how Jews worshipped at the time of Christ. There was also at that time the temple in Jerusalem, which was the main focus of the faith, but that was a place that you went to occasionally. You made pilgrimages there. But most of your weekly life was lived out in the context of the synagogue, at least for males. It's a little unclear exactly how women and children fit into the synagogue system. At the same time, Jews would celebrate the Feast of Passover, and they would have a sacred meal together. And in that meal, they would recount how God delivered them from bondage in Egypt. And that God had a plan for the chosen people of Israel. A plan of redemption. So when Jesus celebrates the Last Supper <coughs> with his disciples, they're celebrating the Passover. But then Jesus transforms that Seder meal into what we know now as the Eucharist, because he shows to them how he is the Paschal Lamb sacrificed for us. And that when we gather together as followers and we break bread, we are to remember him and the promise of the resurrection. So very early, these two components, both of how you worship in a synagogue and the sacred meal, start to come together and become the basis of what we've been doing for 2,000 years. And very early, very early in the church, we have examples of how this was done in, in, in really the end of the first century. So what we do on Sunday mornings has this traditional, unending line right back to the early church. And what we call it varies. We call this the Holy Eucharist. That's what our prayer book has, has designated as this service. But if you grew up Roman Catholic, you might call it Mass. Some Episcopalians still call it Mass. If you are in the Orthodox tradition, you might call it the Divine Liturgy. 
If you're from another Protestant tradition, like Lutherans or Methodists or Presbyterians, you might call it Holy Communion. It doesn't matter what you call it. The structure of what we're doing on a Sunday morning really has been around for a very, very long time. Now, as you know, we're, we're coming up to the possibility of a new prayer book. Did you know that? And General Convention is meeting this summer. Not sure if it's going to be uh, in person or Zoom at this point. It's all up in the air. But they have been working on a revision of the prayer book. And I think that revision is mostly going to be about language. Language changes. But the structure, the structure of the Eucharist goes back centuries. And that's, that I don't think is going to change at all. So what I'd like to do now is go through this first half of the Eucharist, what our prayer book calls the Word of God, or which you might also title the Liturgy of the Word. And this is the part of the Eucharist where we hear from the sacred scriptures. So if you could open to 355, you'll see the very first thing that happens is what's called the salutation. Now, as Episcopalians, we make a big deal of how we start the Eucharist, generally. We always start with music. Music is an integral part of the liturgy. And we actually have an official hymnal, the 1982 hymnal. And why it's official is because the church has said that the text in this hymnal conforms to Scripture. Because you can sing all kinds of crazy things in hymns. And the church wants to be clear that it reflects what's found in Scripture. So we have an official hymnal. So we always start with music. And also something that's become very typically Episcopal and Anglican is we really like processions. <laughs> and we really like dressing up, too. <laughs> so uh, and, 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 uh, when we're at our fullest and our best, we have a crucifer, we have acolytes, we have candles, we have a vested choir, we have deacons and, and, and lectors, and everybody's all ready to go, and we have these wonderful processions, which I think really go back to the Middle Ages, because processions were big in the Middle Ages. And so we've retained that, but I think it's a way of us retaining the idea that something really important and good is about to happen, and it should be joyful. Now, we don't always pull that off, but that's our intent. So then we, we, we process into church, we all take our places, we're all gathered together, and then there's a salutation, a greeting. When someone comes to your house and rings the doorbell, knocks on the door, and you open the door, what do you say to them? Hello. Hello, welcome, come on in. That's what we do when we greet people. And that's what we're doing in church, but we're doing it in a little bit of more ritualized and formalized way. So we have these three salutations in right two in our prayer book. And the first one is, Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be His kingdom now and forever. That is our formal greeting. And that's one that we use throughout the year, except that, as Episcopalians, we also have liturgical seasons. We mark the passage of the year based on the principal feast of the church. So the two principal feasts of the church, what are the two main principal feasts of the church? Christmas, Christmas and Easter. Excellent. I'm so glad you know that. <laughs> that was an easy one. They're going to get harder. So we built the whole year around those two things. So before, before Christmas, we have a penitential season, which is called Advent. And before Easter, we have a penitential season, which is called Lent. And the rest of the year, and we also have the Epiphany season, and we have lots of other feast days. But the rest of the year, we basically put on green vestments and call it ordinary time. But there's nothing ordinary. So when we have the penitential seasons, I mean, the penitential seasons we use, blessed, blessed Lord who forgives all our sins, his mercy endures forever. Um, when we're in the Easter season, we have the great Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed, Alleluia. And then if we really want to bump it up a notch, we have Alleluia's at, at, the, at the dismissal too. <laughs> That's the salutation. Then it says here, the celebrant may say, that prayer that follows the salutation is called the colic for purity. I always do the colic for purity, even though it's an option. I'm going to tell you why. Where that comes from is kind of important to this kind of ongoing tradition of our church. The first book of common prayer, the first reformed book of common prayer, does anybody know what year that was? 
1549. Oh, I heard it. 1549. 1549. Yep, excellent. Very good. I didn't think anybody would know that. <laughs> Archbishop Cranmer, who was the, the uh, was the bishop of the, of the Church of England, was the first one to put the prayer book together. And he was a reformer, and he had two things in mind. First thing in mind he had was he wanted the language of worship to be in the vernacular. Prior to that, Latin had been the ecclesiastical language. And there's some good reasons for it to have been, and there are some bad reasons. The bad reason is no one understood what the priest was saying. <laughs> so what would happen was you would have a priest and the acolyte serving the priest kind of doing their thing up here, and people would be sitting in the pews either you know, planning what they're going to do the rest of the day, or talking to each other, or saying their rosary. They weren't paying any attention. And so they were, they were trying to be faithful Christians and, and, and celebrate the Eucharist, but they really didn't understand it. So Cranmer won, and, and the reformer said, the liturgy should be in the vernacular of people so they can understand it. But that's not the only reason why that prayer is in here. That prayer, that particular prayer, that colic for purity, was a prayer that was said by the priest in the sacristy before the service began. There were a number of prayers that priests had to say while they vested and prepared that no one ever even knew about. It was like done in secret up in the sacristy. And Cranmer felt that nothing should be in secret, that both the clergy and the laity should have the same stuff and be on the same page. So he added the colic for purity in, in, in the Eucharistic rite as a way of saying, not only should the clergy prepare to celebrate the Eucharist, so should the laity, everyone should, and be prepared to enter into this act where we will receive communion. So he put it in the prayer book, and I'm always going to say it as far as I'm concerned, because I think it really, it really speaks a lot of our Anglican tradition. And then after that point in the liturgy, we go into what's really three ancient hymns. The Gloria, the Kyrie Eleisis, and the Trisagion. The Gloria. That is an ancient hymn. They're not even sure how far it goes back, but my guess is it goes back before the New Testament was written. Because you've got to understand, the early Christians, they were meeting together, still in a Jewish context, still reading the Old Testament, but starting to realize that things were, were slowly evolving in terms of not only were they reading from the prophets, but now they knew who the prophets were talking about. And they had the witness of the, of the early community, Christ's resurrection, and his command to gather and to celebrate the sacred meal in remembrance of him. So at that time, people started composing these hymns. And we have this hymn, the Gloria, which in some ways, not only is it a hymn to sing as worshipful, but it's in some ways also a little bit of a creed, saying what it is that we believe. Because you've got to remember, the early Christians were worshiping without the aid of the New Testament. That came later. So hymns, these early hymns, are just as important to us as those New Testament scriptures. And so we sing the Gloria almost every Sunday, except, once again, because of the liturgical year, when we're in the penitential season. And then we use the Kyrie, the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Or we use the Trisagion, Holy God, Holy and Mighty, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on. In your bulletin, besides the outline, I also gave you a little glossary of terms. I'll put it on a different color so you can find it. Pull it out. At the top of the glossary of terms, it says, Every Episcopalian should know. Now, I'm holding my breath. <laughs> so, when I prepared this this week, I, I decided to pick two people from the parish and gave them a little test how many of these things they could name for me. Both people who I interviewed for that could only name about half. And this is a short list. Here's the thing. Because we come from a long tradition, we have vocabulary and words to explain things that we don't use in our daily routine. Doesn't mean they're not important. Matter of fact, there are Latin and Greek terms that have made it to the prayer book that are still important. And these are just some simple things that we should know. So, for example, Agnus Dei, Lamb of God. Eucharist, the very term for what we do means thanksgiving. The Kyrie Eleison, 
Greek, Lord have mercy. The Sanctus, Latin, holy. The Sursum Cordia, the lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord, also Latin. These things are not going to go away, folks. They better not go away. And there's lots of other stuff out here. Like, how often in a conversation does the word kata come up? Oh, I really like your new kata. <laughs> You're not going to hear that outside of church. <laughs> so I think these are just simple things that maybe you might want to familiarize yourself with because they come up in our church language, our church talk. So we've, we've had this, this um, ancient hymn. And then we go into the collect of the day. And this is where I struggle. I've been dealing with this vocabulary for so long that it's like second like nature to me. And I'll say something to somebody about the collect. And I'll go, what? What's a collect? Well, a collect is a particular kind of a prayer that's addressed to God with a petition through Jesus Christ. So we have all these traditional collects that we use in the front book of the prayer book, uh, right after the, the, the office, that um, we have the college traditional and the college contemporary. Every day in the church year, there is a college for that day. And I'll get to that in just a second. So today, we're in the Easter season. And in your bulletin, and I don't have one with me, three years for a second. Every Sunday you get the readings in your bulletin. And it's not just the readings, it's also the collect for the day. And the collect is in some ways the theme of the day. And the theme is always going to relate to the season of the church year that we're in. And there are some preachers, really good preachers, I'm not one of them, who know how to meld in the collect with all the readings. I'm lucky if I can pick one thing out. But, but it's there. It's there to set the day. So we, we, we pray this colic together to understand the theme of where the season we're in. And, and very often the colics do tie in to the readings also, but, but not always. And then we're really up to what this first part of the Eucharist is really all about, and that is the lessons or the readings. Even the term lessons, it's a very old-fashioned term that when we have the, 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 the three scripture readings, there's supposed to be lessons that speak to us, that teach us things. But in more contemporary usage, we call them the readings, the readings of scripture. So the first reading, and, and this is where we have so, many, so much variety in our liturgy, we can't always say, well, the first reading is always from the Old Testament. Because is the first reading always from the Old Testament? No. no. In the Easter season, the first reading is from Acts of the Apostles, another old tradition from the church. But generally, Generally, the first reading is from the Old Testament. And then, after that first reading from the Old Testament, we have a psalm. And what's great about the psalms is, you know the psalms were written as, say it, songs. Or poetry, you can say songs or poetry, same thing. So they really are written to be sung. And we don't always sing them, sometimes we just read them. That's why I really like the 1030 service where we do an Anglican chant. So it, it retains some aspect of it. And then we have the second reading, which is always from the New Testament. Yes, it's always from the New Testament. <laughs> Just check it. Need to pay attention. Yes, it's always from the New Testament, but it's not a gospel. Now, in the early church, when they would do the scripture readings in the service, because we, you know, scripture scholars and liturgical scholars have been able to, you know, mine down to the bottom. It used to say that the readings will be given for as long as possible. That could be a long time, you know. Because <laughs> people used to go to church all day. So they might do a whole lot more scripture reading than we do in our modern culture. So we, for a number of years, have had what's called a lectionary. And what the lectionary does is it breaks down passages of scripture. And by the way, you never read the whole Bible in the lectionary. I don't know if you do that. But it breaks down the, 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 the main readings into a cycle of three years. When I was first ordained an Episcopal priest, we had an Episcopal lectionary. We were the only church that used it. 
But what was interesting about that Episcopal lectionary is it was very similar to the Roman Catholic lectionary, which was also very similar to the Lutheran lectionary. And what happened was that we were sharing a lot of the same resources for how we parse out the year in terms of what the scripture readings are going to be. So somebody had a great idea. Why not have a common lectionary that different Christian denominations could share? Because I can remember, before we had the Revised Common Lectionary, which we use now, there would be times where I was talking to somebody who had gone to either the Roman Catholic Church or some other church, and they had the same gospel. So it was really beginning even before we had the Revised Common Lectionary, but now, as the Episcopal Church, we've chosen to be part of that so that we are reading the same scriptures on a Sunday morning as Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Roman Catholics, lots of people. It's at least the right step in the direction of unity, for what it's worth. So we've had the first reading, the psalm, the second reading, and then we have something called a sequence in. Tom, what's the purpose of a sequence in? To lead us either from what we just heard in the New Testament reading or what we're going to be hearing in the Gospel reading. Now he knows that because he's a deacon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The sequence is to prepare you for the gospel reading. And if you ever listen, Tom, Tom does music the right way. All of the hymns he chooses are in connection to what we are reading in the scriptures. I don't know if you do that. So always, and if, you, and if you're really paying attention to the words and the hymns, which I don't even always do, you start to realize, oh, there are connections. And people who are real good at it find all kinds of connections. So, so, the gospel, so the sequence hymn, once again, music prepares us for the gospel. And then we have the gospel. Where does the gospel always from? New Testament. Right? And it's always from? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes. yes. So it's always from one of the four gospels. And sometimes that's also conditioned by where we are in the season of the year. Now, one thing that we've retained in the Episcopal Church that goes back to the very early church, the only people who are supposed to read the gospel in the liturgy are either a deacon, priest, or bishop. It's something that is still reserved for those who are ordained, because all three of those orders also preach on the gospel. But lay people can read all the other readings. And so we, we try to, in our modern liturgy, incorporate everybody in. And so then we have the sermon. There are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different approaches to what a sermon is supposed to be about and how people do it. And across denominational lines, you're going to find a lot of differences. But in the Episcopal Church, the main concept is supposed to be you're supposed to compose your sermon based on the scripture readings that you just read. It's supposed to tie into the readings. Now, it can be a stretch that it has to be. Because there are some, there's some Sundays I'll look at the readings and go, <laughs> I'm not really be sure what I'm going to do. I usually I find something. And other times it's like, oh, first reading, oh, 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 you know, it speaks to you right away. But it's supposed to reflect the readings as much as possible. But it's also supposed to take the gospel and apply it to our daily life. You know, how as we as Christians are supposed to live out the values and the teachings of Christ and the proclamation of Christ and how and what we do in our daily lives. That's really where the core of preaching is supposed to be rooted in. And then after the sermon, you know, in, in some parishes, after the sermon, there is a pause. Does anybody know why there's a pause after the sermon? So you can think about that. I don't always do that. But a pause. And then after that pause, the very first thing you're supposed to do is the creed. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. I, I, I am concerned about the next prayer book revision. Because there are people in the Episcopal Church who want to remove the creed from the liturgy. Yeah, because the, their idea was, well, in the early church, they didn't do that. Well, in the early church, they didn't have the creed. <laughs> so I think the creed, in our modern context, is essential to be included in the prayer book because the creed sort of acts as a response of faith to what we've just heard. We've heard the promises of the gospel, we've heard the sermon, and now we're going to respond to our faith in what we believe. Now, here's the interesting thing about the creed. We use the Nicene Creed on Sundays. 
Does anybody know what year the Nicene Creed was finally incorporated in its, in its present form? 325. And it existed before that, too. In baptism, we use the Apostles' Creed. And the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed are, are rather similar. What year was the Apostles' Creed finally incorporated in its present form? 398. Oh, yeah, because you're reading the paper, aren't you? <laughs> 398. Probably exists even much further back than that. In fact, there's a tradition in the church that the Apostles' Creed was put together by all the apostles offering a stanza. Now, whether that's pietistic legend or truth, I don't know. But both of these creeds go back to the earliest of the church because as Christians, the early Christians were Jewish at first. And Christ changed that. And they had to come through a long process of saying, well, what it is that we believe now? And so the, the creeds even exist were through a huge, tremendous process of the early church trying to figure out what was special about Jesus. That's really why we have them. And so I am not for removing them from the next prayer. And then after the creed, we have the prayers of the people. The prayers of the people, I think, from what I've read, in some way, at least the form that we have them, is a rather more modern addition to the prayer. The idea being that we take that time in the, in the liturgy to offer up our intercessions, and our thanksgivings. We don't emphasize the thanksgivings enough. We, all, we tend to you know, emphasize our intercessions the most. But for a chance for the community to offer up what it is that they need to pray for. So we pray for people in, in our prayers to people. We pray for events in the world. We pray for our congregations. We pray for lots of stuff. But it's meant to be something that we all share in. And then after the prayers of the people, we have the confession of sin. Now, in terms of order, in, in the penitential seasons, sometimes we have confession first. Now, that's another option in, in the prayer book. In the penitential seasons, you start off with confession because it's a more penitential season. But there's a reason why the confession of sin is in the liturgy. Raise your hand if you grew up Roman Catholic. In the Roman Catholic Church, in the liturgy, there's something called the general confession, just like we have. But it doesn't count. That's the part I never understood. In the Roman Catholic Church, in order to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, you need to go to private confession with a priest. Okay. Well, if you have to do that, why do you have a general confession in your liturgy? It's because the early church had a general confession in the liturgy. Where we're different is that we accept that general confession. Whether you confess to God alone in your room, in the general confession, in the liturgy, in a sacramental rite with a priest, they all count. They're all valid. And the reason we have it as part of our liturgy is, a, is as part of that means of preparation. We are going to gather and share a sacred meal together where Christ is present and we're going to receive the body and blood of Christ. We should be prepared for that spiritually. And so one way we do that is by looking at where our relationship is with God. And that's what the confession says. What are the things that are keeping us from close relationship with God and our brothers and sisters? And we pray for the grace of God to help us to overcome those obstacles so that we can fully participate in the Eucharist. Another option is that in the Episcopal Church, an old tradition is we don't have the confession of sin in the Easter season. Why would we do that? Because for one thing, it's not a penitential season. It's a season <laughs> of rejoicing and joy. So there's an old option of omitting the confession of sin from the general confession in the liturgy in the Easter season. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't all in our hearts in some way prepare for receiving the Eucharist. Whatever way that, that works for you. And then this first part, this liturgy of the word concludes with the peace. Now it's interesting. The prayer book allows for two placements of the peace. Does anybody know where the other placement is? Within the Eucharistic prayer, before you receive communion. Now, those of you who grew up Roman Catholic, that might sound familiar. Because in the Roman Catholic Church, that's when they do the peace, just before they receive communion. Because it goes back to that scripture that, you know, before you come to the altar, you know, make it right with your brothers and sisters. And so the peace, I think, and the peace 
You know, all right, so who goes back to 28 Perth? What was the peace like in the 28 Perth? There wasn't one. <laughs> there wasn't one. It had fallen out of the liturgy. So when they brought it back, Episcopalians were aghast. I have to shake hands with the person in the pew next to me? <laughs> let alone hug them? Or let alone, as the scripture says, give them a holy kiss? <laughs> this was a sell for the Episcopal Church, but luckily, thanks be to God, the peace has returned to the liturgy. And so that sets us up for the second part. And the second part we're going to do next week, which is the, the actual celebration of the Eucharist. But it's all one part. There are some people, like, you know, we, we sort of very much have these in two parts. So after the piece, what do we do? We do the announcements. Now, there's a lot of people who don't like the announcements after the piece. They feel it kind of breaks the Eucharist in two, but it is a natural break because you've had the Liturgy of the Word, now you're going to the Liturgy of the Eucharist. So I don't mind the announcements at that point. You know, it's a, it's a little break as we, as we enter the other thing. But there are some people who also argue maybe we should just have the announcements at the end of the liturgy. There's a lot of opinions when it comes to the liturgy. But the core of it, and the most important part, is this structure. The structure of word and sacrament is always going to be part of how we, as Episcopalians, worship. And I think if we can know more about it, and if we can open our hearts and our minds to the tremendous thing that happens when we come together on a Sunday morning, that has the power to transform our lives and to help us transform them.
Arnold and Andrew Bracciante, Jane Coleman, Miriam Ben Kiki, Nicole and Sarah, Madeline Vita, Kathy Volpe, Norm and Jan Terracino, Louise De Rosa, John Bracciante, Steve Hoover, Dawn B, Sheila Tweeddale, Linda Miller and family, the Vanderwater family, Harriet Lowe's and family, Ginny Esposito, Ella McDonald, Terry Dahl, Teresa Lewis, Dixon Spencer, Brendan Burke, Leslie Ariana, Aaron Nelson, Barbara Wanson, Keepa Sands, Jeannie McMonagle, Sue Delpuff, R.J. Storm, Ife Collymore, Heather Transgrady, Sean Burke, and for those patients that are in hospice care. And we pray for the blessing and health of all our parish members. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Scottish Episcopal Church. We pray for all military personnel serving overseas and at home, remembering Master Sergeant Stephen Brown stationed at Pearl Harbor, Sergeant Amanda Volpe stationed at Fort Rucker, Captain William Ash deployed to Europe, First Lieutenant Nikolai Degenhardt stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia, Petty Officer Adam Dornbush deployed to the Pacific aboard the ship USS Nimitz, Ray Fioris Foley serving with the Coast Guard, and Fireman Lydia Hedgepeth stationed in Norfolk, Virginia with the Navy. And we pray for an end to hatred, prejudice, violence, and racism in our country and in the world, and the wisdom and compassion to overcome our divisions and mistrust as members of the human family and as beloved children of God. Comfort and heal those who are sick with the coronavirus throughout the world. Protect their caregivers, doctors, nurses, first responders, and last responders. And I ask your prayers for the departed and for those who have died in the past week in hospice care. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. And we also come to share in the kingdom. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine and a peaceful end to that conflict and for peace throughout the world. Now let us pray for our own needs and those of others, either silently or aloud. And we pray in thanksgiving for the 12th anniversary of the consecration of Bishop Mary Glasgow, and also in thanksgiving for my coordination 17 years ago yesterday. start by thanking the 14 people who came yesterday to help do some cleanup around the church. Um, it's amazing when you have a, a group of people how much you can get done. And so I very much thank everyone who came. I know when I woke up this morning, my lower back was telling me, yes, I did something yesterday too. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. We got some stuff done. Um, there is a vestry meeting this week uh, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. for those of you who are on the vestry. Um, we're in the process of getting ready for the garden tour. Right after the service, uh, raffle tickets will be on sale. They will be next week too, so if you, if you didn't come prepared today, you can pick them up next week. We had coffee hour 
after the 9 o'clock service, but I think because we're still in the midst of COVID, that people aren't running to sign up. And yet, I really do believe that that coffee hour is an important time for us to be together to fellowship. So I'm going to still encourage people to consider doing coffee hour. We have some preparations that make it a little safer. Uh, we're not going to mingle around while we're doing it. So think about signing up. This coming Saturday, uh, May 21st, at 7 p.m. at the Presbyterian Church, there's going to be a talent show. And the talent show is a fundraiser for a Habitat, Habitat Unity Build that the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Episcopalians are doing together. And this will be for a house in Newburgh. So if you can, please come. I will be there. And uh, it should be rather interesting. You may even know some of the people who are doing talent, uh, uh, variety type act things. And so come if you can. It's next Saturday. Also, I wanted to mention, um, you know, we're kind of winding down the Easter season. Um, in, in June, we will have the Feast of Pentecost, which is one of the major feasts in church year. And the Sunday after that is the Feast of the Trinity. And the Sunday after that, we're going back outside. So I wanted to mention, we are going outside again this summer. It will we'll start on June 19th, and it will be at 9 a.m. But if it rains, we're going to come inside. So if, if there's any rainy days this summer, we'll be inside. And um, also, the, the, the Wednesday services will be inside all summer. But we thought, because people really enjoyed being outside, we could do it again. Are there any other announcements? Just following up on, on the uh, sermon, the offertory here is taken from the Talmud. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true pastoral man who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death. And by rising to life again, he is one church of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanksgiving. For falling 
great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.